In this section, we'll go over the technology in conventional software RTOS. To start with, let's go a little deeper into what tasks are. We offered a simple introduction to tasks in the last section, but to be more specific, tasks are simply what we call the software applications that an RTOS controls. The RTOS activates, reactivates, terminates, and preempts tasks. Also, tasks can utilize RTOS system calls. System calls are also referred to as APIs. In this tutorial, from now on, we will be referring to system calls as APIs. RTOS also manages software called handlers, but we'll explain that in more detail later. We used this slide before, but let's look at it again. This is how the RTOS switches between Receive Task 1 and Receive Task 2, managing them both. So then, what does it do while these two Receive Tasks are idle? During these times, like here, Receive Task 3 becomes active. The RTOS activates or reactivates tasks as needed, and when those tasks go to waiting or terminate, it switches to other tasks. So then, how does RTOS manage these switches? Let's look at the concept of task switching. Let's assume that task 1 is currently running on the CPU. At a given point, if it's time to switch to task 2, then first the current CPU register set, including the program counter and stack pointer, is written to local memory in the task 1 save area. Then, all of the register values saved in the task 2 save area are read and written to the CPU registers. Finally, the CPU starts running. It fetches instructions as per the new program counter. In other words, it will activate or reactivate task 2. Basically, task switching is implemented by replacing data in the CPU registers. Now we should define some terms. We'll start with context. Originally, the term context referred to the flow of software processing. Deriving from this, context now means the CPU register set contents of a given executed process. As a result, the rewriting of the CPU registers, as we just discussed, is called a context switch. Whenever a task switch occurs, a context switch is executed. Next is dispatch. A dispatch is when one task transfers execution rights to another. Therefore, dispatch processes accompany context switches. Let's move on to the TCB, or Task Control Block. The TCB stores data related to each task. For example, it contains the task ID, state, priority levels, its program address and stack pointer at time of starting, and more. There is a TCB for every task, like you see here. The RTOS refers to the TCB whenever it switches tasks or whenever a task invokes an API and, whenever necessary, it updates the data in the TCB as it runs processes. But what do we mean by task state, as we just heard in the TCB explanation? Every task must be in a certain state. Typically, this state can be running, ready, waiting, or dormant. Every RTOS manufacturer has developed its own methods, so each RTOS has its own variations. But nearly every RTOS will have these four states. Any task currently being executed is in running state. Only one program can be executed on the CPU at a time. Therefore, only one task can be in running state at any time. 
Ready indicates that a task can be executed at any time. Since another task is currently running, a task in the ready state is waiting for that task to transition out of the running state. To be in waiting means that the task is waiting for a certain event. For example, as we discussed earlier, when a received task invokes the delay API, it goes into waiting. In this case, the awaited event is the completion of the wait time indicated in the argument. Dormant state means that a task is registered to the RTOS, but it is kept at rest without being activated. Every task must also have a priority level. For example, assume task 1 has high priority, task 2 has medium, and task 3 has low priority. If at this point in time all three tasks are ready to be executed, then task 1, with the highest priority, will go into running, and the other two will move into ready state. At this point, task 1 invokes the delay API. Since task 1 is now in waiting state, there is no running task. The RTOS chooses the ready task with the highest priority, meaning task 2, to move into running state. At this time, a context switch is carried out. Next, at this point, task 2 then invokes the delay API. Since task 2 now goes into waiting, there is no running task. The RTOS chooses the ready task with the highest priority, now meaning task 3, to transition into running. At this time, a context switch is carried out again. At this point, task 2's delay ends and then it enters ready state. And since the RTOS knows that task 2 has higher priority than task 3, it moves task 3 into ready and task 2 into running. At this time, a context switch is carried out. Also, task 3's programs currently being executed were suspended, and task 2 took over execution rights. We call this preemption. Choosing the ready task with the highest priority is called scheduling, and the algorithm for this is called a scheduling algorithm. Every task must be given a priority level so that the scheduler can choose the task with the highest priority level. In this example, the highest priority is 1, second highest is 2, and so on. So task 7, which is priority 2, will be chosen. So then, what happens when multiple tasks have the same priority level? In this case, you can see here that every priority level has a queue. The scheduler dispatches the task at the head of the highest priority level queue into running. This algorithm is called priority-based, first-come, first-served, or FCFS. So let's sum up what we've discussed about tasks. A task is an application program designated on the RTOS. All tasks have a priority level. Each task is assigned a state. Scheduling is the choosing of one ready task to transition to running, and a frequently used scheduling algorithm is priority-based FCFS. Let's move on to an explanation of handlers. The software modules managed by RTOS are called tasks, but RTOS also runs handlers. A handler is a process executed by preempting currently executed software. More specifically, Handlers include the interrupt handler, executed when interrupts occur, the periodically executed cyclic handler, and the exception handler, which runs when errors occur. The interrupt handler is called the ISR, interrupt service routine. 
Handlers are basically higher priority than any task. Also, interrupts are usually disabled while handlers are executed. Let's start with a look at ISR. As you can see on this diagram, High Priority Task 1 is currently running. At this point in time, an interrupt occurs and Task 1 is preempted when the ISR activates. The ISR terminates at this point, so the execution write returns to task 1 and it transitions into running state. Here is an example of multiple simultaneous interrupts. Interrupts are assigned priority levels, and if a high priority interrupt occurs while a low priority ISR is running, the higher priority ISR will be executed as you see here. An ISR can invoke an API. In this example, ISR invokes the API Activate, which will start Task 1. At this point, if Low Priority Task 2 is running and an interrupt occurs here, Task 2 will be preempted and the ISR will execute. At this time, High Priority Task 2 is dormant. Then, the ISR invokes the Activate API for Task 1 at this point here, and Task 1 moves into Ready State. At this point here, the ISR terminates and the scheduler runs. Since Task 1 is higher priority than Task 2, Task 1 will move into Running and Task 2 goes to Ready. So the ISR invoking APIs like this is a special feature, a kind of communication between a task and the ISR. There are two types of interrupts, OS-managed interrupts and non-OS-managed interrupts. What's the difference? When a non-OS-managed interrupt occurs, an interrupt program is immediately executed. For OS-managed interrupts, the RTOS receives the interrupt and activates the interrupt program, which is called ISR. In most cases, non-OS-managed interrupts take higher priority than RTOS programs. Since they are executed in places not recognized by the RTOS area, naturally the interrupt program is unable to invoke any APIs. However, since overhead is small, their real-time responsiveness is outstanding. OS-managed interrupts have the benefit of invoking APIs from within the ISR, but processing overhead is high, so they can't be used with processes needing high real-time performance. However, since all task transitions originate from interrupts, the ability to invoke APIs from within the ISR is a great benefit. Let's move on to the cyclic handler. This diagram is based on an example from automobile steering control. Software for motor control needs to be activated on a periodic basis. The handler for this kind of periodic activation is a cyclic handler. Now to recap handlers. Handlers include ISRs, cyclic handlers, and exception handlers. Handlers are basically activated by some kind of interrupt. Handlers are higher priority than any task. In addition, interrupts are disabled during handler execution. Interrupts are either OS managed or non-OS managed. Non-OS managed interrupts have high real-time performance and low overhead, but no APIs can be invoked from inside the interrupt management program. On the other hand, OS managed interrupts can invoke system calls from within the handler, but overhead is high. So that concludes our explanation of handlers. Now we'll go into more detail about APIs. As we've already said, 
APIs are a means for tasks to utilize the RTOS functions. But now let's look at some specifics. In this presentation, we will be displaying APIs like this. The API arguments are contained in parentheses. For example, a delay API set to wait for 100 units of time will be displayed like this. Let's start our discussion with the basic APIs, the ones used to activate, to terminate, and to delay a task. The Activate Task API activates another task, meaning that it moves the task from dormant state to ready state. On the other hand, the Self-Terminate Task API ends the task which invokes the API, meaning it moves it into dormant state. We can draw it out on a timing chart like so. When High Priority Task 1 activates the Low Priority Task 2, it moves the task from dormant to ready. At this point in time, High Priority Task 1 ends, and since Task 1 enters dormant, there is no running program, so the scheduler runs, moving Task 2 from ready to running. This diagram shows an example of Low Priority Task 2 activating High Priority Task 1. When Task 2 activates Task 1, like here, Task 1 moves into running state, and since it is higher priority than Task 2, Task 2 is moved into ready, and Task 1 is executed. This API terminates the indicated task. More specifically, it forces tasks in ready or waiting states to move to dormant. In this diagram, High Priority Task 1 moves Low Priority Task 2 from ready to dormant state. This is the Delay API, which we have seen several times already. By indicating an amount of time, a task can move itself into waiting for that period. When the period ends, the task moves to ready. In this diagram, Task 1 invokes the Delay API at this point, and a context switch occurs. At this point, the delay period ends and so Task 1 enters ready state, and since it has higher priority than the currently running Task 3, Task 1 enters running state and Task 3 moves into ready. That covers the Activate, Terminate, and Delay APIs. Finally, I'd like to tell you about Renesis Electronics' unique technology, Hardware Real-Time OS. Hardware Real-Time OS is Renesis' original technology, implementing RTOS completely in hardware. Hardware RTOS greatly minimizes overhead while guaranteeing worst-case interrupt latency. This technology offers the extremely high real-time performance required by embedded systems. For more details, please see our website.